this is me. Uh, my name's Dylan Beatty. I run a company in London called, well, I run a company on the internet called Ursatile, where I do remote training for software teams, uh, training courses in .NET. And also now I do lots and lots of stuff around doing remote workshops and remote presentations. So if you or your, uh, you know, your team are struggling with any of that stuff, look at ursatile.com, check that out. I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies. I run the London.NET user group, uh, which is now a user group that uh, meets all over the world because it's all virtual and we talk about all kinds of things as well as .NET. But that's been going on and off uh, about sort of 10, 12 years. So it's one of the oldest .NET, .NET groups in the world. I also, uh, some of you probably know, I invented a programming language as a joke that became a real programming language. There was this whole thing about rock star developers and you know, you go on LinkedIn and you see all the adverts going, we need to hire a rock star Java database administrator. And somebody said, why don't we just make a language called Rockstar? So I did, and then it became a real thing. And now it's a it's a joke with a formal spec and a reference implementation. But if you go to codewithrockstar.com and you type in a bit of code and you click the button, it will run it in your browser, and then you are a Rockstar programmer, and you're officially part of the world's most prestigious certification program. Now. I've been building websites since 1992. I've done pretty much every job in tech, from help desk up to CTO, uh, done all kinds of things. And I spent a large part of my career working for these people. This is Spotlight. They're a directory based here in London of actors and actresses, and they do recruitment for films, television, theater, all that kind of stuff. And because Spotlight is in show business, whenever we worked with any agencies and they wanted to do like, you know, the impressive PowerPoint presentation to try and win business, they would always use this as their first slide, the, the theater masks of, you know, tragedy and comedy, happiness and sadness. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about today, because I've noticed a pattern over the course of my career as a developer. I've worked on some projects that should have been really, really good. You know, we had an interesting problem to solve and, you know, good frameworks and good tools and a nice team, and it was all looking really good. And after a couple of weeks, people kind of just start looking a little bit down and beaten, and they're like, oh, this is, and like, what's the problem? I just, I can't get this to work. I can't get that to work. And once the team are sort of starting to look unhappy, at that point, in my experience, it's only a matter of time before the project just falls apart and you don't end up with anything good. And I've also worked on projects that should have been impossible. You know, it was, we had to do something really, really difficult, limited resources. We really couldn't get access to all the stuff we needed. But after a couple of weeks, the team had really pulled together and we're like, this is great. We're actually, you know, everything has started to work and fit together and everyone got really happy about it. And, you know, I started thinking, about is there some kind of correlation here between happy teams and, and unhappy teams? And is that something we can actually look at as a way of improving the success rate of development projects? Now, you know, I want to be clear, this is not a talk about mental health. That is important and that is something different. Um, and I'm not qualified to, to talk to you about that. This is about how not to be grumpy. This is about how not to be pissed off. This is about how to try and do little things that mean you and your team are going to have good days and you're going to go home and you're going to come back the next day and be like, I like my job. This is pretty cool. And and that's one of the things I'm talking to you about. The other theme of this talk today is something called uh, discovery and discoverability. Now, discoverability is a term that comes from education psychology, the study of how people learn. And if a system is discoverable, it means you can explore it for yourself and you can find out how it works. It's a system that encourages you to poke around and try things and solve puzzles and learn stuff. And the fascinating thing about that as it applies to software development, there is a, a chemical, it's called a neurotransmitter. In our brains, it's called dopamine. And... <laughs> Um, dopamine is, uh, it's one of the neurotransmitters that controls happiness. Now, dopamine is the addiction chemical. Dopamine is why people get hooked on drugs and gambling, because when you win at cards, you get this rush of dopamine and you feel good. Dopamine is the thing that keeps you playing Tetris all night. You know, you just solve one more level or complete one more puzzle. Um, but dopamine actually makes people better at learning. 
if you are, you know, you solve puzzles, then when you learn the solution, when you figure that out, you will remember it. You're better at retaining information, which means you can learn things quicker. You can apply that information more quickly. And so if we can incorporate these discoverability patterns into the way we build software, then when somebody else comes along and they start working on our code base, they're going to get these little dopamine rushes. One, they're going to enjoy it. It's a pleasant sensation. Two, they are going to be better at learning it. Three, they're going to become more effective more quickly, which all sounds to me like, you know, a pretty good idea when it comes to encouraging adoption and, and helping teams be productive. Now, let's talk a little bit about learning. Now, I have this uh, very, very scientific graph here, and uh, we have this phrase in English. We talk about a learning curve. We talk about something that has a very steep learning curve or something that has a very shallow learning curve. And uh, when I, I do this talk for real, like in a, in a physical room, I normally put this up and I say to everyone, you know, give me a, give me a show of hands. Actually, put, it, put, it, put your answers in the chat here. So if you think that the blue curve here is better, just type blue. And if you think the red curve is better, you just type red right? And if you think maybe that's a bit of a stupid question, and how can one learning curve be better than another one? Well, yeah, you're right. Neither of them is actually better. Because the thing about a learning curve is that it is just how quickly do you get proficient at something? Now, the blue curve here, the one on my left, um, that's, you ever work with those people who go home and like a long weekend, they come back on Tuesday, you're like, how's the weekend? They're like, I learned Haskell. And you're like, you did what? They're like, yeah, I learned Haskell in the weekend. And you're like, wow, and that's, that's a steep learning curve. You know, they've gone from zero to proficiency very, very fast. The red learning curve, you know, the person you probably worked with once who you're like, you've been using Word for 10 years. How do you still not know how to do a page break? And they're like, I don't know. I just press return every time. That's a shallow learning curve. That's a long period of time, and they're not learning very much along the way. Thing is, both of them are okay doesn't matter because that's very much down to how hard somebody wants to work as to how quickly they want to get better. The thing that you got to watch out for, you know, is you don't want learning curves that look like this. This thing here is a localized peak. Oh, let me just get that slide caught up. There we go. Now that localized peak, that is, uh, I'm assuming some of you have worked with .NET and ASP.NET, and particularly ASP.NET Web Forms. Now, if you remember working with this, or maybe some of you still are, there's this thing when you first start learning Web Forms, where you've got this toolbox, and you've got you know, a text box, and you've got a data grid, and you've got all these, and you get really good at it, and you learn about data binding, and you learn about you know, on item data bound, and post backs, and all this kind of stuff. And then one day, your boss comes to you and goes, hey, we need to do a streaming media, like video download that you can resume resume and you look in the toolbox and there's nothing there you're like there isn't a resumable video playback control in here and then you start kind of scratching away and you're like this is not right like i i, I need to know about something called http position headers and buffers and offsets and and none of this stuff is in the toolbox and you go home thinking I don't know how any of this works. Like I've learned web forms, but now I need to unlearn everything I learned about that. And then I need to start learning HTTP and you go home feeling pretty miserable. Now, this is kind of like this, you know, it's if you ever seen this, this famous example, it's the step-by-step -step instructions for how to draw an owl. So first of all, you draw an oval for the head and then you draw an oval for the body and then you draw the rest of the owl. And that's it. And now you know how to draw an owl. It's easy, step by step, you know. And what we've got there is at step three, everyone's going to go, hang on, what? Like, I, I got step one, I got step two. I have no idea how you got from here to the next part, because that learning curve looks like this. And basically, this piece here might as well not exist. What we've got is we've got kind of easy level and advanced level, and we haven't given anyone any help to get from being the beginner to being advanced. Now, the first time I ever started thinking about these kinds of things in my career was uh, back around probably 10 years ago. I was playing around with a thing called Castle Windsor, which is a, an IOC container for .NET. And I had, this was before Stack Overflow existed. That's how old this was. And I, I downloaded Castle Windsor, and I installed some DLLs and stuff and got it all working. And I pressed go on my ASP.NET project, and I got the yellow screen of death. And I was like, oh, it didn't work. But then I stopped and I looked at this. I was like, oh, now look at this error message. Look at what it says really closely. Because one, it says, looks like you forgot to register. Now, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never done this before. But I was like, oh, yeah. 
I forgot. That's what happened. Looks like you forgot to register the HTTP module. I'm like, okay, that's a thing I have to do now. And then it says to fix this add, and it gives you this little snippet of XML that's right there in the error message. And you copy that and you paste it into web.config and you press refresh and it works. And you go, amazing. And actually three things happen. One is you think I like Castle Windsor. I love the people who built this. They care about me and they want me to be happy. Two is you solve the problem. You go home with a smile on your face. And three, because you got that dopamine rush of solving the problem, you're going to remember that. You've learned because you got this piece of information at exactly the right point on your learning curve. You're going to remember that, oh, yeah, I need to register the module. And next time it's going to be like, oh, yeah, we need to register the module. Don't worry, I remember that part. And, you know, this all boils down to user experience. And, you know, some of you are probably thinking, well, we have a UX team or we have design as they do UX or, you know, it's, it's very easy in software to think there's front end and front end handles user experience. And then there's back end and there's, you know, compliance and DevOps and whatever, all the other teams you've got. And the users is somebody else's responsibility, but it's not because whenever we write code, whether we're creating database schemas, we're building components, APIs, whatever, somebody is going to end up using the code that we write. And those people are our users. And we can do all of them a favor by learning some principles of discoverability and UX design and incorporating them into what we're doing. Let's look at an example. So you get a job. And you go in on day one and your new colleagues are like, hey, you know, welcome, great to see you. Here's your desk and the coffee's over there. And this is all back in the days when we were allowed in offices together. Um, and there's the bathrooms and stuff. Right, let's get you up and running. Here you go, get the website running locally on your machine. So you, you start poking around and you know, you've got your login and your password and everything. You're like, uh, you're gonna look in the, the GitHub organization and there's a, a repo in there called website. So you clone it and you open it and it's empty. And you go in there, there's another one that's called a web project. So you clone that one, that one's empty as well. Ah, website 2018, it's probably that one, also empty. And eventually you, you turn to your, your person sat next to you, your new coworker, and you tap them on the shoulder and they take their headphones off and you're like, hey, I'm sorry to bother you, uh, where's the website? And they're like, oh yeah, website's in a repository called sales. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, the sales team started the first website, so they kind of, it's in, don't, don't worry about it. So you clone the sales repository, and then you go, oh, I can't compile it. DLL not found. You tap them on the shoulder again. They take their headphones off again. You're like, hey, I can't find this. Uh, so there's this DLL, like finance.dll is missing. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're here. Let me share my C drive. Right click, everyone, full control. Just grab whatever you need. And then you can't find the database. And they're like, oh, let me get your backup. And you know, this goes on. And if you're lucky, maybe at the end of the day, you've got something working. And maybe your new colleague doesn't already hate you. If you're unlucky, you're just going to get something like this. You're going to end up at a complete brick wall, dead end, absolutely no idea what to do about it. Can't fix it. No clues. Nothing can help you. This is bad user experience. So you quit and you say, I'm sorry, I don't like working in this company, it didn't work out. And you go and you get a job with the company across the street. And you go in on the first day and they're like, hey, welcome, coffee's over there, there's the, the toilets and everything, here's your desk. Um, get the website up and running locally, good place to start. Oh, and by the way, uh, the website project is called Applejack. And you're like, Applejack, all right, you're going to GitHub, bang, Applejack, there it is. Git clone Applejack, you get the whole repo up and running. And you press build and you get a message pops up on your screen saying, hey, restoring packages. And you're like, oh, cool, interesting. And then you look closer and it's restoring packages from nuget.mycompany.lan. And you're like, that's cool. This team have got an internal NuGet server. All of their packages are deployed locally so they can restore them. And then you get it up and running and a screen comes out that says, hey, looks like you're running the project for the first time. Go and look in the SQL folder of the GitHub repo. You'll find the data definition scripts. Run those, get yourself a database. You've solved the problem. Boom, dopamine. You've remembered that the database is in this SQL folder and you've got it up and running and it's like 11 o'clock on your first morning and you've got the whole system running and your new coworker says, hey, you want to go and grab a cup of coffee? And you're like, yeah, great. And as you're walking out to get coffee, you say, why is the project called Applejack? And they say, oh, we named all our projects after ponies. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, we just needed names. And ponies have a lot of names. So we stole pony names and we use those. And it sounds silly, but naming things is such a massive 
uh, you know, massively beneficial strategy when it comes to organizing software projects. If you have a bunch of components and you give them names you can relate to, you know, name them after ponies, um, Applejack and Fluttershy and Jubilee and all this kind of stuff, then you'll start thinking about data flow interactions in terms of those contexts. You'll start thinking about data flowing from one thing to another thing. And because they all have names, this will allow you to organize documentation, wikis, log files. It'll let you go online and search for stuff in your GitHub repositories and find references to it. This is a really simple and powerful pattern for helping make your projects more discoverable. Let's look at another kind of discoverability. Now, the first computer that I ever had was one of these as a, a 286 so proper PC, as 286 PC. It had a megabyte of RAM. And when you switched it on, it would grind away for a minute and then it would go A. And you would say, hello. And it would say bad command or file name. And you would go, ooh, all right, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see if it has a menu. And it would go bad command or file name. And you would say help. And it would say bad command or file name. In fact, the only fun thing that you could do with MS-DOS on a 286 PC was you could type, if you're happy and you know it, syntax error. And it would go syntax error. If you're happy and you know it, syntax error. If you're happy and you know it, and you're yeah. So that was a bit of fun you could do with DOS. But other than that, it was a horrible, horrible operating system. You had to read the manual and look up the commands. And eventually you're like, D-I-R, OK, that's directory. Oh, look, there's some files. And you started to figure it out. Now, the other computer that you could buy around the time when I was getting started with MS-DOS was the Apple Mac. And when you switched one of those on, it would grind away for a couple of seconds. You get a little picture with a smiley face on it. And it would say, welcome to Macintosh. And it would grind away for a few seconds. And then when it finished booting, boom, you'd get a visual desktop with things that you could click on and some things that were familiar. And you worked out pretty quickly, like, OK, so there's a thing here marked file. You figured out how to use the mouse. And then you're like, I can explore. I can click this thing that looks like a trash can. Oh, look, those are files I deleted. OK, that that's, makes sense. And there's disk copy, and there's file, and there's edit, and there's all these things. And if you click the wrong thing, it didn't matter. You could just kind of go back and, and step back a notch and get rid of it and try something different. <coughs> And it encouraged exploration. Now, a lot of people kind of look at this and they go, OK, MS-DOS and command lines, those are bad because they're not friendly. And visual interfaces are good because you can click on things. So obviously, the way to make our product user friendly is we will just put all of the buttons on the screen and you just click on the things that you need. Uh, so this is, this is Visual Studio. See how easy that is to use? You just you type your program here in, in the little hole in the middle. <laughs> now, this is even worse. Because this screen, I switched on every single option in Visual Studio 20. I think this is 2017. And you know, there's some stuff in here, like the debug menu that all of us use all day, every day. And there's some stuff in here, like the UML model inspector, that I'm guessing nobody has ever, ever actually used ever in their life, ever. If anyone here has used the UML model inspector in Visual Studio, um, drop a message in the chat and tell me what you used it for. Now. The problem you've got is we have these incredibly sophisticated, complex tools, but we want to make them easy to use. Or we want to make them easy to get started with. And so we need to think about how can we take our users on a journey. Now, the best example of this that I've ever seen is this one here. Good morning. You have been in suspension for 50 days. In compliance with state and federal regulations, all testing candidates in the Aperture Science Extended Relaxation Center must be revived periodically for a mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look up at the ceiling. Good. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look down at the floor. Good. This completes the gymnastic portion of your mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. There is a framed painting on the wall. Please go stand in front of it. This is art. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, stare at the art. You should now feel mentally reinvigorated. If you suspect staring at art has not provided the required intellectual sustenance, reflect briefly on this classical music. Now, please return to your bed. Good morning. 
So that's, I'm sure you recognize that. It's the opening level of Portal 2. And it's a wonderful example of using a storyline and narrative to help the player work out how to play the game. That little thing there, it's funny and it's interesting and it kind of sets the tone, but it also introduces you to the controls, how to manipulate objects, how to move around in the game space and work things out. Now, there's another lovely example of this, which is kind of more relevant to, to development and stuff. <laughs> when Microsoft Edge was released a few years ago, a whole bunch of developers like me got it and went, oh, cool, it's a new browser from Microsoft and it's not Internet Explorer. This must be awesome. And you kind of go in and you start poking around. You're like, where's my stuff? And you go in and you right click and you're like, what? I've got select all and I've got print. I can't work with this. This is supposed to be a, a tool for professionals. And you kind of look around a little further and you see there's this, this three dot menu up in the corner and you click on that and you find, ah, F12 developer tools. Now you remember F12 because nothing else on here has an F number. So you think, all right, F12, this is important. And you click it and then Edge goes, cool, all right. You click that and it says inspect element and view source will now appear in the context menu. Because you've just said to the browser, you said, look, I'm a serious professional. I'm not like, you know, browsing kitty pictures on Facebook and looking at pictures of my grandkids. I'm a serious web developer here. I need to, my tools, I need inspect element, I need view source. Now, <clears throat> for a lot of people, inspect element and view source are things they only ever click on by mistake. And then they phone you up in a panic and they're like, I've broken the internet and the codes are leaking out and the bottom half has fallen off Facebook and this kind of thing. But for developers, that stuff matters, we need it. And so that I thought was a lovely way. It keeps these commands out of the way where people aren't gonna click on them by mistake. But once you've clicked that button in the menu and said, look, I'm trying to build a website here, help me out. Edge goes, all right, I got your back, that's fine. Here you go, have your, have your, your view source and your inspect element. Now, you can use these kinds of ideas through in all kinds of different ways when you're, you're building your own code bases. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with uh, intelligent code completion, what Microsoft call IntelliSense, which is where you probably don't know exactly what you're doing, but you kind of have a good idea. So you type console dot and then you get foreground color equals, okay, I've got these choices. Let's go with console color dot green and then we're gonna do a console dot right line hello, and we're going to run that, and that's going to work. And, you know, we're all familiar with this. Like I said, Microsoft call it IntelliSense, but most editors now have some kind of intelligent code completion that will, will help you out, just when you can't quite remember what something's called. But you can use the same idea in your own class libraries to help other people get to grips with them and help them out at the exact point where you get stuck. Now, I've been building .NET code since 2002, and I still cannot remember how to write a database connection string. It just will not stick in my head. So when I go via SQL equals new SQL connection, and then I get this thing, it says, you know, you have to specify the connection string in here. And I'm like, well, I can't remember how to write that. You know, I, I, I connection string is one of those server equals or is it provider or is it UID equals whatever. So I wrote this little static method. Now look at the pop-up on there. This is hostdomain.com, database, user ID, password. At the exact moment where I'm stuck, that pops up on my screen. It says, hey, here's that syntax that you can never remember. And I put it in. And as soon as I close that bracket, it disappears. It's help that pops up at exactly the right moment, and it sticks around just long enough for me to do my job, and then it gets out of the way without interrupting the flow. And if you have a look at that, that's just an XML comment that's been defined on that method. There's this static connect method, and this is one of the little bits of code that I'll often paste in when I'm, I'm playing around or spiking things or, or setting up new projects and stuff. <clears throat> now, these kinds of ideas, these are really, really good when you have a good idea what your user is trying to do. You kind of know where they got to and it's pretty sure, you're pretty sure you know what they're going to try and do next. But often you don't know what your user is going to try and do next. And that's when we get onto another discoverability pattern. It's a thing called signposting. And signposting is a way of saying to your user, hey, you made it to here. Here's a bunch of stuff you might want to try next time around. Now, the, the best example of this that I've seen, I do lots of work with designing APIs and, and REST APIs particularly. And, uh, you know, the World Wide Web is a hugely successful piece of software that is built on hypermedia and signposting. When you go to Amazon.com, all the blue links, all the, the hyperlinks on that page, those are signposts. Those are things saying, hey, you can go here. You can do this. You can explore this. And we can bake the same kind of ideas into the way we build APIs. Now, I built a project with Spotlight a few years ago 
that was a, a proper REST API. It used hypermedia controls and everything. And we put this component on the front of it. This is a little thing that's built in JavaScript. It runs on the client. And it allowed people to explore our API. So we gave you one click switching between test mode and live mode. So you can hook this into a sandbox. And what it allows you to do is to navigate around the resources returned from that API as though you were browsing a web page. And then we incorporated some hypermedia actions into it as well. So you could go to one of these resources you can click on it. It shows you what else you got in there. You can go in and explore a related resource and click through navigate links. We're going to go into this one here and you see there is an update method on this one. We've got this, uh, this is an actor CV for someone who's 1.8 meters high. We change that to 1.9, we click submit, and it updates that in real time. Now, this, we built it initially as a testing tool so that we could kind of test the stuff we were doing. Then we shipped it, and then we noticed that the quality of, you know, one, people integrating with our system were much happier because they could try stuff out on here, and once they knew what they had to do, then they'd go and translate it into um, PHP or Ruby or whatever they were running on the other end of their integration. Uh, but also support calls went down. Because if something didn't work, someone would go and try it on here. And the bugs that we got, they were actual real bugs. They were things that someone said, look, I tried it on the Explorer and it didn't work. I think there's this bug here. I think this should say this. Um, and it was brilliant. It was a really, really interesting idea. So someone uh, dropped in on the, the, the chat and talked about Swagger UI. Um, so Swagger is a very, very similar idea. The thing about Swagger is it doesn't have that idea of hypermedia exploration. Swagger is just like, here's a massive menu of things, and you click a thing, and it's like, here's the result. Um, what we wanted to do, this is a hypermedia format called HAL, the hypertext application language. And we extended that and used that to provide a way of saying, well, look, you start here. This, this entry point is like the home page of the API. And you click on that, and it says, OK, well, here are the resources. And you can go and navigate through those resource graphs that way. Um, and now GraphQL has come out, which has some very, very interesting sort of similar ideas about exploring the, the shape of APIs and stuff. But that, that's for another talk. Now, we've talked so far about, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a comment in chat. Most of the time, it seems developers don't think about other developers using their products. Um, and that's another kind of big, big issue we have is when you're writing code, it's obvious because, of course, it's correct because you wrote it and you know exactly how it works. But when you look at someone else's code, this is obviously hot garbage and it doesn't make any sense. And it's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's that you don't understand it. And so compared to your own code, your own code's lovely because you know how it works and their code's nasty because you don't know how it works. Um, and there's actually some pretty deep psychology around the feeling of being a accountable for something you don't understand. Someone says, here, here's some code that the person who wrote this code has quit. So it's now your code. And if it breaks, you've got to fix it. And uh, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing with this. But that also is, is for another talk. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, these are so far we've looked at a bunch of techniques you can use when you're writing code to help other developers and yourself in the future when you've forgotten it make sense of the way your code base works. Now, I want to talk about what happens when the code actually goes live and when it's running in production. Um, so, you know, it's done. It's running. It's absolutely fine. And uh, what is the difference then between good code, bad code? So you get into work one morning and the phone is ringing. And uh, when the phone is ringing, that's bad because it means that email and Slack are down. Uh, so you, you pick up the phone and it's a it's help desk to put a customer through. And they're like, there's a problem with the system. And you're like, uh, OK, uh, let me look into it. Let me take your number. I'll give you a call back. And you hang the phone up. And the phone rings again. You pick it up. And there's a problem with the system. And the database is down. The internet is broken. And you're just being bombarded with these things. And of course, the boss is getting upset. It's like, customers are angry. What are you doing about it? And finally, you get someone on the phone. And you're like, uh, yeah, can you? And they're like, do you want me to send you a screenshot? You're like, yes, send me a screenshot. And they send you a screenshot. And it's this, request timed out. And your boss is breathing down your neck going, how long to get this fixed? And you're like, well, I don't know. There's about 70,000 lines of code. I can review one line of code every 30 seconds. So it might be fixed this morning. It might be fixed after Christmas. I don't know. Um, now, you're stressed, and you're unhappy. And the boss is unhappy. And the boss is yelling at you. And the customers are yelling at the boss. And you want to yell at the customers, but you can't, because then you'll get fired. And this is just a horrible, horrible situation for everybody involved. So you quit. And you go and work for the company across the street. And you get into work one morning. And on the wall in this company, there is the big screen TV with the monitoring dashboard on it. And normally, this is green. And green means good. And green means everything is working. And one morning, you get in. And you have a look at it. And there are red squares on the dashboard. And you look at it for a second. You're like, OK. 
uh, main website's down, intranet's down, content delivery network is down. All right. Uh, and immediately you can kind of be like, well, okay, one, everything else is okay. I don't need to go and investigate any of those. Database is fine. Email relays are fine. That's all good. Website, intranet, both of those depend on the CDN. So let's just go and check. And so you can get ahead of it. First of all, you say to everyone, hey, looks like there's a problem with the website and intranet. We're looking into it. Next update's going to be in 15 minutes. I'm working on it. Boss is like, cool, you know, what do you need? You go in, you look at it. Yep, the CDN is down. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe the certificate wasn't renewed or something because, hey, who could ever see a certificate expiry coming? Like, we have no idea when those are going to happen, right? But you fix it and you get it all back up and running. And the whole situation is just much, much happier because that level of visibility and being able to see quickly that there's a problem and see where the problem is means you can get ahead of the curve and get in and fix that. Now, this is a, this is a real picture of a real TV that was on the, the wall in my dev office at Spotlight. And what we noticed about this, this just happened to be in a corridor that everyone walked along every day to get to the meeting room. And when that was all green, people would be like, this is good. And when there was something red, you know, like people in offices come around and they're like, we're collecting to buy someone a birthday gift or a baby shower, whatever. If the screen was red, they'd come back later. They'd be like, okay, they're clearly working on something right now. There's red on the wall. This is a bad time. And sometimes they'd be like, hey, is everything okay? Do you need me? Does anyone want coffee? Or I can go ahead and get sandwiches. And just having the screen on the wall created this kind of everyone is on the same side and it gives them enough context that they're like there is a problem what can we do to help fix it gets everyone on the same team i never saw that coming we just built this so we knew what was breaking but it had so many kind of uh you know implications and benefits for making everyone feel more engaged with what we were doing now building these kind of monitoring dashboards it's kind of like you know the the example with visual studio you do not want to put lights and dashboards on every single system you've got because above a certain level there's always going to be something in your organization which is not working perfectly right now and if you expose all of them you're going to end up with something that looks like this and there are too many lights, there's too many indicators, one of them is always going to be red, and you'll end up just ignoring it. You want something more like this. You know, if you look at the dashboard in your car, there's like 10 lights in there, and you kind of know there's the ones that come on when you switch the headlamps on, and there's the ones that tell you that the, the brakes need looking at. But most of the time, the lights are off, and if the light comes on, you know there's a problem, and you know you've got to take it to the shop. Now, the idea of building monitoring dashboards, that's one really good way that you can expose the internals of your system and allow people to see what's going on with them. But you can go a step further. Now, when I was a kid, the, the Star Trek that I grew up on was Star Trek The Next Generation. And one of the things that I loved about that show was whenever they showed the engine room of the Enterprise, they had this huge warp engine kind of set in the background. Now, they could have just hidden that behind a panel and gone, yeah, the warp engines are behind the panel. But they didn't. They made it part of the show. And and if you ever saw that set and the thing in the back wasn't lit up and it wasn't glowing blue, you knew there was a problem because that was going to be the plot for this episode. The Starship Enterprise is crippled and the warp engines are down. And that was because they had taken this internal detail of the way the ship worked and they'd exposed it. They'd made it part of the narrative, something that, that people could connect to. And you can do the same thing with software. You can take the covers off and you can actually show running software that you can get in and interact with in real time. Now, uh, there's a framework, a .NET API framework called Nancy, which I actually think has, has recently been deprecated because a lot of the ideas from Nancy have now been incorporated into the, the new versions of .NET Core. But Nancy had this wonderful feature that it has a built-in HTTP dashboard. So you could go onto any Nancy system, you put a password in your config file to enable this, and then you can go on, you go to slash underscore Nancy, you punch the password in, and it's basically you've just kind of opened the front of your car while the engine is running and you can see inside your live application. You can go and you can see, you can review settings. And this was really good because this doesn't show you what you think is running. This shows you what's actually running. And you can be like, oh, that's interesting. I thought we'd change that. And then you can go and check whether the deployment failed or whether one of your config changes isn't being picked up. And it would also let you do interactive diagnostics. You can actually go in and you can run methods. You can look at all of the different endpoints that are running and get results back from them in real time off a real life system. And the best thing about it, the thing that's really, really powerful is it has a feature called request tracing. And you switch on request tracing. And then everyone who hits your website 
it logs it. It's like the network inspector in Chrome, but it's from the other end. It's from the server. So you can now go in, you can have a look at any one of these requests that came in on live production systems, and you can see all the HTTP headers, the X forwarded force, authentication details, response type, all that kind of stuff. And as soon as you're finished with it, switch it off. Disabled, doesn't matter. Very, very low impact that you can switch on for just as long as you need it. Um, uh, Raluca says, uh, played with, with Dynatrace tool for monitoring Java-based applications. Uh, yeah, very, very similar kind of idea. Something that you can switch on, you can see real production traffic, and then you can switch it off again. But the drawback to monitoring and you know tracing and all that kind of stuff is you need to be there when it happens. If it keeps going down in the middle of the night and you don't find out till you get back to work, you weren't there to see it. You don't know what the problem was. To get around that, we need to talk about logging. Now, logging is like time travel for software development because logging will tell you not what's happening right now, it'll tell you what happened in the past. Let's imagine that you get into work one morning and the website's down and you do a little bit of diagnostic, look at the dashboard, you're like, all right, database server is being really slow to respond. I see, database server is at 100% CPU consumption. Right, we need to know how it got there. This is a data point, database server is busy. Now, maybe, it got there like this. Maybe it's just been ramping up very slowly over a long period of time. Maybe it got there like this. There's some regular scheduled task, a cron job or a Windows service or something that has suddenly just hit the end stops and you've run out of capacity. Or maybe it was absolutely fine and it's been ticking along perfectly fine and then yesterday you deployed something and oops, there might have been some bad code in there. But the time scale is important as well. If these three graphs, if this is one day, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you know, the blue one, you're like, what happened this morning that would have been slowly throttling the database? The red one here is, what did we do? And the green one is, do we have anything running every hour? What if the same graph is January, February, March? You know, what if this one, you're like, whoa, whoa, we're doing something every month that has suddenly started blowing out the database, or we've got something been slowly increasing since the start of the year, or the red one is probably still, oops, we shouldn't have deployed that to production without checking it. But understanding the pattern and the time scale gives you so much more to go on when it comes to how do you start investigating the problem with, with the system. Now, most logging systems, they give you five levels. They give you fatal, they give you error, they give you warn, they give you info and debug. When you log something, you've got to decide what level you are logging it at. Is this a fatal message? Is this an error message, a warning, info? And a lot of the difficulty, particularly if you're trying to consolidate logs from multiple different applications, are because teams and organizations don't really agree what all these things mean. Now, the way that I, I sort of tend to think about these, fatal means this is everything is unresponsive, multiple users, big problem, stop what you're doing and look into it. Now, in most places I've worked, there are some applications that are not important enough to ever have a fatal error message. It's like, what does this app do? Oh, on Wednesday afternoon, we use that to run the invoicing spreadsheet. Well, if it breaks on a Sunday, does anybody care? No, it will, on Wednesday, it'll fail. They'll call us, we'll come in, we'll fix it. That's absolutely fine. It's one of our team using it. It doesn't impact you know, customers who are out there. We can work with that. Some apps just are not important enough to ever be fatal. Errors and warnings are inevitable because software is not perfect. Hardware isn't perfect. Networks are not perfect. Something's gonna go wrong. Now, to me, these are things, the difference is that an error is something that maybe somebody noticed and then they kind of press refresh and it went away. A warning is something that you kind of didn't notice. Like, you know, a great example, say you've got something that converts uh, between currencies, converts a uh, Romanian lay into, into euros. And one day you got to get a response from the API and you get a 500 server error. So, okay, we'll fall back to a cached version. It's only 10 minutes old. Next time, okay, now it's 20 minutes old. Next time, 30 minutes old. Half an hour, that's fine. Your system's still up. If it's an hour at that point, maybe you're worrying about it. If that system's down for 24 hours, at that point, you might be using the wrong exchange rate. You could be losing money or you could be overcharging customers. Now, the thing about errors and warnings is that individual ones are not useful. What you're interested in is volume. It's like uh, you ever go on public transport, like, you know, the metro or the tram, and you see like one person and they're dressed up to go to a costume party and they're wearing a costume. And you're like, okay, fine, they're having fun. But then you go on the metro and you see this, you're like, this is interesting. Something is happening here. I want to understand the story behind what I'm seeing.
Now, info, everything's fine. Startup, shut down. The reason why info messages are important. Let's say that we go home for a long weekend, leave the office on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We come back in Tuesday morning, nothing in the log files. They are completely clean. There's two possibilities here. One, we have had a perfect weekend. No errors, no timeouts, no warnings, nothing crashed. Two, the logging system failed. Which one of these do you think is more likely? Now, info messages, I tend to just use for business as usual. You know, you got a cache that expires after 15 minutes. I just log, hey, you know, we're flushing the cache. That way, you look at it on Tuesday morning, you're like, yeah, we had a perfect weekend. We flushed the cache every 15 minutes, um, spun up another web server when we got a bit busy, we shut it down again. It's all good, nothing to see here. And then debug. Now, debug is for line by line, method by method. Uh, one of the best habits I think we can get into as developers is the second you reach for console.write line because you want to know what's going on, stop, install a logger or configure a logger and start using log.debug for that stuff instead. And then leave it in there and log all of those things. And you know, you're thinking, what, all the things, everything? Yeah. Because all of that stuff that's useful when you're developing the application, you can switch it off. When you deploy to production, you flick the switch and debug logging is now disabled. In most frameworks, it doesn't even incur any cost. They just, you know, those lines get commented at. But one day, you're going to be trying to fix an issue that only happens on production at three o'clock in the morning and you cannot work out where it's coming from. Doesn't happen on staging, doesn't happen on localhost. You can't see anything about it in the info and the error messages. And that's when you are going to want to be able to switch on debug logging on production and go in and look at it and see what's actually going on. We could actually have saved a lot of confusion if we just, instead of using these names, uh, log.fatal should be called log.wake me up at 4 a.m. on a Sunday. Because really, if you write that in your code, you know you mean it. This should be apologize to user and raise a ticket, you know. Log.warn, no, no, no. Log.tell me if this happens 1,000 times, because that's what we care about. Log.everything is fine, just checking in. And log.debug should be called log.fill my C drive with stack traces, because that's what happens if you forget to switch it off. Now, <laughs> let's recap. Let's just go over the rules of happy code. So first of all, naming. Yes, names are important. Remember Applejack, remember ponies, call them after you know, anything you want, cities, countries, airlines, give your projects names, creates a sense of ownership, makes it easier to do diagrams, makes it easier to do traces and emails and search the wikis and all those kinds of things. Pay attention to naming. Learning curves. Steep is fine. Shallow is fine. Smooth is good. Watch out for localized peaks. Remember the owl. If you are going to put error messages in your code, put in error messages that help people solve them, not error messages that just say could not be completed, unspecified error, you know, end of story. Um, you know what your user is trying to do. That might be you in six months time. Put as much context as you can into the information you give back to the developers and distinguish between developer error messages and end user error messages. Developer error messages, tell them, you know, give people some context, help them figure out what's going on. Think about signposting. Think about how did your user get here and what are the things they might be trying to accomplish next? How can you help them figure out what's available and how what they need to integrate to make those things work? Remember the Starship Enterprise, take the covers off, provide ways that engineers can get in and see what's actually happening with your application in real time. Think about monitoring, think about observability, think about creating endpoints that show you what's really going on when it's live in production. And the last rule, the, the one rule to rule them all, if you like, is remember all of us are creating user experiences. Whenever you write some code, you put anything in production, you put it on NuGet or GitHub, somebody somewhere one day is going to be running and supporting and maintaining that code. And it is up to us whether that person is going to have a bad day and go home grumpy or they're going to have an awesome day. And they're going to go home with a big smile on their face and they're going to come back the next day ready for some more.
uh, what other log monitoring tools are you using? Um, at the moment, I'm not using anything because uh, since the whole pandemic lockdown thing started, I've been spending most of my time doing uh, training and workshops and, and those kinds of things. Um, I have worked with uh, Logstash. I've worked with a company called Log Entries, which is a hosted service that we uh, used to use at Spotlight that worked really, really well for us. Um, the uh, Heroku has some pretty good log aggregation stuff built in there that I've worked with. Uh, but look around for something that, that most of them kind of have a level where it makes sense and then suddenly they get quite expensive. So if you're looking around for log aggregation tools, don't just look at what you got now, but look at what you think you're going to have in a year or two, because it really sucks when you have a tool that you love and then suddenly you realize that now you're going to have to pay 2,000 euros a, a year to be able to use it when previously it was free. Um, now, I think it's worth paying 2,000 euros a year for good quality stuff that saves you time. But if it happens by surprise, you're like, oh, damn, we don't have any space in the in the budget for this. This is going to be a problem. How do you convince management it's worth investing in a logging system? So any kind of negotiation about, you know, management hates spending money on tech because in a lot of companies, it's very difficult to appreciate the cost benefit analysis of technology. Um, they think, well, the website's obviously free because websites just run on the internet and how does that, does that cost anything? And then they're like, what is this Amazon bill for? What is this Azure bill for? Why do we need to hire another developer or another contractor? Um, and as developers kind of I think for a long time, a lot of us are like, our oh, business is boring. We don't care about finance, you know, all that, that kind of stuff. And what we can do is you need to understand a little bit about the other side of it. Because, you know, you want someone to buy a logging system, you've got to argue that somehow the logging system represents the best solution for what your business is trying to accomplish. Now, if you're like most companies, you're trying to make money, you're like, okay, well, work out how many, one, how many hours you have spent that would have been saved if you had access to this tool. Two, work out what is the, there's a thing called an opportunity cost. You're like, we got a feature that would have made us 10,000 euros in the next three months, but we couldn't build it because we were too busy trying to find bugs in our log files. So not having that has actually cost us 10,000 euros in revenue because we were all busy doing this instead of building it. And once you kind of learn a little bit about that kind of thing, it can kind of be difficult because there's often politics and personalities and uh, you know, lots of people, the developers are like, hey, we want to come to the finance meeting. They're like, why? You don't know anything about business accounting. How do you tell if a logging system has a high or low enough threshold? Um, when everything is going OK, I think you want to be able to see a couple of hours worth of messages on a single screen. So um, if you, you know, your, your logs are frequently empty, then you're going to keep wondering, is there anything actually going on here? If there's too much coming through on the logs, um, then uh, you're just going to, stuff is going to get lost in the noise. At somewhere, now you want to be able to turn that up and down because you always want to be able to dive in deep and get more detail out of it. Uh, blank screens are generally bad because like I said, that you don't know if you've logged anything or there was just nothing to log. Um, uh, but, you know, go for something. The, the thing is to get into the habit of looking at it and you know, looking at it regularly. If you go in in the morning and you cannot work out what happened overnight because there is too much information, you want to dial those down or get a filtered view or some way of aggregating that into something you can look at for a couple of seconds and see whether everything is, is, is fine or not. Um, and tweak it, you know, you turn it up, okay, that's better. No, it's not, it's worse. Okay, turn it back down, turn it down further. All right, that's worse, no, turn it back up. Um, and change one thing at a time. Don't be like, right, let's change this, filter that, modify that, modify that. Okay, that doesn't work. Which one was responsible? We don't know. Move one thing, give it you know, two or three days, see how it works, change something else. Online conferences, uh, workshops. So online workshops is actually, it's something I've done lots of. And for certain kinds of material, it works really, really well. Um, I have a, a, a introduction to distributed systems with .NET course that, that I run, which is one day. And when you do that in a classroom, everyone's kind of there. They just got their laptop with their, and there's never enough charging points in the room for everybody. And then, you know, we get stuff working with message queuing and gRPC. And uh, it's like, yay, big deal. We sent a message across a table, like a distance of one meter. That's not exciting. But when you do the same workshop remote, you're like somebody in, in Kharkiv types something into a screen and somebody in Manchester goes, oh, I just got your message. And then they push a button and it uses gRPC to bounce that off a calculation server in Portugal and get the result back. And uh, you know that kind of stuff, it works really nicely. And when people, are, when you're doing stuff that's very hands-on and a lot of coding, um, I like being able to, you know, 
teach things from my office here at home where I have all my stuff and multiple screens and all that kind of thing. And also for the attendees, it's nice being able to join from home where they're comfortable and they don't have to get a hotel room and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think there's definitely a point for workshops that involve a lot of code and a lot of on-screen content where online works just as well and probably better than doing stuff in person. Um, flip side, if you've got workshops that involve lots of group work and interactivity and conversation, those, you can run them online successfully. I've done lots, but it gets difficult. It's trying to juggle all the different elements becomes, uh, it's like trying to do a, a teacher training course and fly a plane at the same time. And your audience can't notice that they're on a plane because if they do, then you failed. So you just need to push this button, juggle that, mute that microphone, bring up that screen share. Here's the link, put that in the chat. And uh, <laughs> But there are definitely elements of online that I, I think most events are going to keep. Um, one of the lovely things about it is people who would who could not attend in-person events because, uh, you know, mobility issues or they're stuck at home taking care of somebody or they couldn't get a visa to come to Europe, they can join these conferences now. And to me, that that's a really, really big deal. That's something I think is, is amazing and something that I want to keep. How far do you think functional programming will evolve with respect to OOP? Um, I think... <laughs> Functional programming is always going to exist as something distinct. I think, you know, F sharp and uh, Haskell and Scala and Clojure and those kinds of languages, I think they will always have a sense of we are doing pure functional programming and, uh, you know, other people are not. But I also see, you know, .NET's what I know best. I know F sharp and I know C sharp and I see a lot of good ideas in C sharp that started at an F sharp where there is kind of more willingness to embrace those kinds of ideas um, and then filter those sorts of things backwards. I think, you know, functional is a, it's a programming style. You can write functional C sharp and people will go, well, that can't be functional, that's C sharp. And you're like, well, no, it is functional. Look, I've got immutable data types in here. Um, you know, everything is, uh, is stateless. We've got functions, we've got continuations, we've got, you know, applicators and all these kinds of things happening. You can do that. The thing is, because it's in C sharp, that's not normally how people do it. Um, OOP is incredibly successful. And once in a while, someone gets a lot of buzz on Twitter by saying, OOP is a huge mistake. And it's like, well, yeah, that's because the only reason anybody ever goes on Twitter is to say they think something's a huge mistake. Um, and, you know, I think once in a while, it's nice to go on Twitter and go, hey, yeah, no, I'm still doing this. It's been 10 years. I still love it. It makes sense. And I like the way it works. Um, but I think, you know, the being able to inject functions as a way of composing behavior is an incredibly powerful pattern. Uh, one of the, the the earliest examples of this I ever found in my career was being able to inject a string transformer into arbitrary chunks of code so that when we were processing stuff that was going to end up on a web page, we could put the HTML encoding and HTML escaping routines and inject those as a function so that these other functions, which were doing business and domain logic and you know invoices and price lists and stuff, they didn't need any reference to the web stuff. They just knew when you made an invoice, please run every line through this function. And then the function we inject comes from uh, something which has references to system.web and HTML and those kinds of things. Um, and that previously would have been this horrible class that needed to know about the finance system and know about the internet. And by doing function injection, it made it really, really simple and stripped down. And you know, those kinds of ideas, I think you know, more people uh, get used to it. JavaScript, someone just said long live JavaScript. Um, the you know the idea of function callbacks that jQuery popularized and now they're being used all over the place with things like React. Uh, more and more people are thinking in terms of all right when something happens, I don't need a class, I don't need a you know full full class instantiation. I just need a method that says this is what's going to happen next. Um, but you know I don't know the the life cycle of languages is they start out small and people pick them up because they're new and shiny. I remember when, when .NET 1.0 came out and C Sharp 1.0, and everybody loved it because it was easier than Java, because Java was already starting to get a little bit kind of bloated, and, and some of the design mistakes, like checked exceptions in Java, were causing a lot of frustration. Uh, so you know, .NET 1.0 came out. But if you look at .NET now, you know, .NET 5 and C Sharp version 8, and they've now got 9 coming up, that's a really daunting, complex thing to try and explain to a beginner. You know, there's still people out there, you know, good developers who've got serious, you know, heritage in working in, in JavaScript and Ruby and stuff going, what is .NET? Is it a, a language or a framework? And what is C Sharp? And what is VB? And what is framework and core and entity framework? And, you know, and you do realize that when 
you are part of a, a community or ecosystem, the kind of stuff makes sense to you and you forget how to explain it to people coming in from outside because you kind of grew up with it. And then new language come along, like, uh, you know, Go and Rust uh, and people pick those up and they're like, oh, wow, look, a new language. It's really small and easy to learn. And, you know, you give it 10 years and people are going to come up with something else. And there's still new languages. I found out the other week about a language called Pony that I'd never heard of. Like, literally, I had no idea this language even existed. And then you go and look at it, you're like, this is a real language with love runtime and libraries and packages and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then there's the sort of more specialized languages. You know, Erlang, I don't think is ever going to be mainstream. But then there's a bunch of stuff that just would not work if Erlang didn't exist. Like, if you ever played with SonicPy, which is music programming language for, for Linux and Windows machines. Um, that's got an audio engine written in Erlang that allows you to do dynamic function patching, which would be almost impossible in any other language. And if Erlang didn't exist, we probably wouldn't have Sonic Pi. So um, yeah, there you go. That's a sort of slightly roundabout answer. What is your favorite architectural model? The smallest one that possibly works. Um, I think one of the... Uh, <laughs> The difficulties with architecture is choosing a model first and then writing the code to suit it, whereas actually you want to understand the problem, write the smallest amount of code that solves the problem in a way that you can still understand, and then look at it afterwards and go, oh, yeah, hexagonal architecture, not bad. Um, it helps to be able to have conversations, you know, talking about hexagonal architecture or NTR architectures or CQRS, but there's also so much misunderstanding, you know, two people in a meeting like, oh, hexagonal architecture, and one of them leaves the room going, right, every method will have exactly six properties on it. And you're like, that's not what hexagonal architecture means. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if, if minimalism is an architectural model, that would be my favorite architectural model. So. <laughs> Bars, hibernate, solar, animate, falcon, flask, and silver, stripe, and typo, three flow. Agave, pixie, hazard, NBC, code, ignite, lithium, and PR radio. Raphael, Bobo, Bottle, and Tornado, Django, Cherry Pie, NWSGI, Glass, Hammer, Web, Sphere, Red, Bin, Turbo, Gears, Albatross, Aquarium, Selenium, and Web Pie. We're gonna build a framework, cause we wanna use one, but don't wanna choose one. We're gonna build a framework. Didn't like the other, so we'll write another. Site Met Tapestry, Maverick and JSP, Barracuda, Akaramba, Groovy on Rails, Intercal on Interstates, Cascade and Hibernate, JTBC, Ruby on Rails, Doctrine, Jasmine, Java Forms, Engine, Active Record, D3, Dapper and Velocity, Time Leaf, Top Link, Pyramid, Rethink, Horary, Comedor. Mojito. We're gonna build a framework Cause we wanna use one But don't wanna choose one We're gonna build a framework We didn't like the other So we'll write another <laughs> mm -hmm.